What is going on, everybody? I am Cole Morganti, and you are listening to the Came Unto Christ Ministries podcast. We talk about Jesus, Joseph Smith, and everything concerning Mormonism and Christianity. We don't think they're the same. But we're devoted to reaching Latter-day Saint population with the true gospel of grace. If you're a Latter-day Saint, I hope you listen to what we have to say. If you're not, I hope you learned something for today's episode. But cozy up as we talk about the most important things in life. And I leave you with this, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Let's get into it. What is going on, everybody? This is Cole Morganti. I'm here with Stan Hankins, and we this is the first episode of the Came Unto Christ podcast. What's going on, Stan? Hey, how's it going, Cole? I'm really excited to be here. This is this is going to be a really good time. Yeah. So um, we are filming this in the midst of General Conference right now. Uh, General Conference uh, started today. For those that don't know, there's uh, for um, the Latter Day Saints, there's two conferences that go on every year. Um, one in April, and the second is in November. Yeah. It's. I mean, I think it changes, but it's in the fall. Um, so. Yeah. So anyways, this is our first episode. So we are here. Um, first off, if you don't know who we are, we are just a couple of evangelicals that decided to start a ministry uh, to witness to the Latter-day Saint population. Uh, we're not Mormons. Uh, we think that actually the Latter-day Saints and us differ heavily on a lot of different things. And so we actually started this so that we could reach the Latter-day Saint population with the true gospel of grace. Um, also, uh, this isn't just for them. Uh, if you're a Christian, we hope that you're listening and that you're, you want to learn something from these episodes, maybe something you didn't know about the Latter-day Saint beliefs, so that you can also witness to your Latter-day Saint friends. So uh, with this first episode, we wanted to go over some of the major differences that we think a lot of people don't know or don't understand about Latter-day Saints and Christians. Um, a lot of people will say that they're the same, that there's not that we differ on the uh, on the on just the little things but overall it's pretty much the same thing uh so we have a we have about six differences that we're going to go over um for this episode um but uh just an intro to who we are stan if you want to talk about maybe who you are and uh what you're doing right now and then uh, i can do the same and then we can move on to the main podcast yeah absolutely um hey everyone my name is stan hankins and, um, you know, I'm just a evangelical Christian, <laughs> grew up um, in the church, um, you know, well, my, you know, I was raised as a, kind of a, a Baptist, but I grew up, um, you know, and believed in, in Jesus from a young age. Um, but yeah, I just became fascinated with the topic of Mormonism a lot, uh, you know, within the last couple of years. Um, I had some friends that were Mormons and, and I just thought, you know, this is really interesting. Um, these people, you know, they say that they believe in Jesus, but their idea of who Jesus is is so different from what I believe Jesus is. Um, and I think, you know, you may have encountered Mormons before. You may have um, had missionaries knock on your door before, and they tell you um, that they have, you know, this this different revelation from God about who Jesus is, and it's it's so different. Um, so I think it's really important for Christians to understand what those key differences are because they are very <laughs> important differences that actually divide us on lines of orthodoxy. So yeah, it's really important to have to, an understanding of that as well as so we, we can help, you know, further discussion between Mormons and, and hopefully, you know, build relationships with them and engaging with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, same with me. I actually, um, it recently, I didn't even know really what latter-day saints were who they were what they believed or anything i uh same thing as stan i'm an evangelical uh i, I go to nc state university that's kind of how stan and i got connected so, uh, stan is up in raleigh as well um met each other and we actually met each other visiting the temple dedication that they were doing because they tore down the raleigh temple built it back up and then two ratio chapters went to go to that and then that's how stan and i met but um for those that don't know ratio christi is a apologetics uh evangelism ministry on campuses around the united states and i was blessed enough to be the uh, student president for the one at north carolina state university i first got connected to it in wilmington north carolina 
And so now when NC State went online, I actually had the opportunity to be an intern for Rashir Christie. And so there was an open spot here in Utah and I went not even understanding what I was getting myself into, but then come to find out that this is the least Christian state out of all the states. Um, but you never hear about that because all the polls will put Mormonism into Christianity. And so what you think is, is that this, this state is perfectly fine, super religious, nothing's going wrong, but you, but actually it's, I want to say it's less than 3% evangelical, I think. And, uh, the County that I'm in right now, Utah County, uh, where I live is the least evangelical County in the United States, uh, less than a 0.5% Christian. Um, and so talk about an unreached people group. So that is, so, um, my car, my heart kind of broke for the LDS people, same as stands where we just think these people need the gospel. And so that's why we're doing this. Um, and I, so I want to say first off that, uh, w when we use the term Mormon, uh, we're not trying to be degrading in any way. Uh, we we're using it more so as just a, a, a contrast name. Um, I know some people can get offended uh, by that name. We don't, we don't mean to offend anybody by that name. It's just, uh, a uh, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a mouthful. And uh, uh, through these podcasts, saying that over and over again will probably get tiring. So, uh, and again, and with this podcast, uh, I, Stan can agree with me. Um, we're doing this out of love. Uh, if you're a Latter-day Saint listening to this, uh, we do not hate you. We do not um, condemn you in any way with this podcast. We just want to bring to light what we think are some really big differences that matter we think truth matters and we think we have the truth. You think you have the truth. And so we just hope that in listening to this, that, um, you know, you can, uh, learn something about what we believe and maybe even understand where we're coming from, where, cause, cause we think that these differences are so big that they have eternal implications. And so, um, we do this out of love to, uh, talk about the things that matter. And, um, and, uh, you know, if, if, if you want to, hear more uh you want to talk to us contact us please maybe we can have you on your po on the podcast you can we, we we can we can debate it out we can do anything um so that's so that's uh mainly that's what this episode's about so we're, we can get into the uh six differences uh six major differences that we think we have with the latter-day saint community but first off we want to talk about just what Mormonism is, if you don't know what that is. So Stan, if you want to take it with just what what is Mormonism, how did it start, um, and kind of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the, yeah, the topic of Mormonism is really fascinating, and there's a lot of history, um, you know, that goes back all the way to the 1800s. Um, so we really, when we talk about Mormonism, we have to start with Joseph Smith. Um, Joseph Smith, he was the founder of Mormonism. He lived in the 1800s. Um, I think he was born in like 1805. Um, and um, he was raised in Palmyra, New York, which is, um, it's kind of like an upstate area of New York, a uh, very rural area. Um, he was, he was born in a poor family. Um, his dad was also named Joseph Smith. So he is actually the junior of the family, Joseph Smith Jr. Um, and it's just looking at the, the kind of the, the history, the culture of that time period, um, the 1800s, there was a lot of kind of religious activity in that area. Um, you may have heard of kind of um, the Great Awakening, uh, which is kind of talks about like um, kind of religious revivals that were happening in that area. Um, a lot of um, kind of religious fervor of, you know, things that were happening. And so that's the context of who, you know, what was going on with Joseph mm -hmm. Smith. Specifically the uh, Second Great Awakening. Yeah, sorry, the Second Great Awakening. And so, yes, yeah, so Joseph Smith, he was, he was raised in this area in New York. Um, and, you know, as the story goes, if you ask a Mormon, um, so Joseph Smith, he was looking to find out which church to join. And he prayed to ask God for wisdom, um, quoting a verse in, in James uh, 1, 5. Um, and he took that to mean that he could receive direct revelation from God by asking him, um, you know, direct knowledge from God. And so he, he goes into this, um, this grove um, and he has this experience. Um, he calls the first vision. Um, now, this is kind of a complicated story because there's actually multiple versions of this first vision experience. Um, but if you ask a, a Latter-day Saint, they will tell you the official version um, of the church, 
which is that Joseph Smith, he goes and prays in this, um, this grove of trees. Um, and he, he kneels and all of a sudden he has this, um, dark presence come upon him that binds his tongue. So he can't speak. Um, and then before he knows it, there's this pillar of light. Um, and these two spiritual beings, uh, appear before him. Um, and, and one of them says, this is my son, hear him. And so one of them is meant to be God, the father, um, and the other is meant to be Jesus Christ. And so right here, right off the bat, you have a denial of the historic Orthodox understanding of Christianity because you have two beings appearing between before Joseph Smith. Um, and of course, Christians have always understood that God is one being, not two separate beings. Um, and so in this, uh, you know, in this first vision experience, Joseph Smith um, recalls that these beings told him that um, he should join no other church because they're all, uh, they have all apostatized. They're all an abomination. Um, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Um, and so he told them that they, that Joseph, well, he told Joseph Smith that he needs to, um, to not join any of them. And essentially, um, you know, over the course of several revelations that Joseph Smith received, um, he was instructed to, to start his own church. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So basically, um, the difference is, uh, what we'll hear from the Latter-day Saint population is that the church. So with this great apostasy, uh, we can dig into that just a little bit more that, uh, they believe that, uh, a few centuries after Jesus came, that all the teachings, um, well, actually the, the stance has been changed just a little bit now, but all the teachings, um, the authority of the priesthood is what you'll hear a lot that that was lost, um, after Jesus came. So Jesus came, preached, preached his message, did, did what he did on the cross. Um, and then after he left, all those teachings were washed away and that they, they believe these wolves came in and corrupted everything. Right. And so that now you can't even trace you, you that they say you cannot trace, uh, Orthodox Christianity, Mormonism, whatever you want to call it through the ages up until Joseph Smith. And that, um, like what we would say, instead of a reformation, they would say that the church needed a restoration. So that's what they call it is the restoration of the church. So that's why they call themselves the church of Jesus Christ of latter day saints. Um, cause we are, they, they believe that we are in these last days. So, uh, yeah. So basically like, uh, Stan said right off the bat, we get a huge difference when it comes to who is God. And we'll get into that just a little bit more. Um, but that's a brief summary. I think Stan did a good job of just how Mormonism started and where it is now. Um, so our first, okay. So our first thing that we want to talk about, I think Stan and I, that we just want to lay out first off is just what is truth and how can we come to know it? Can we come to know it? Right? So this, you, you might, this might seem like a trivial thing, but actually we differ on this very, very differently. And I, I would say that a lot of Christians also, um, come to know truth in a way that isn't biblical, you know? So, um, so what is truth? What, 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 what would we say? I think Stan and I would both agree that truth is just whatever corresponds with reality. Truth is just what reality is. But, and, and I think almost anyone can agree with that definition. And I think the Latter-day Saints would too. But the main question is, how do we come to know the truth, right? So um, te the teaching from the Book of Mormon, which the Latter-day Saints believe in Moroni, is that uh, Moroni 10, specifically 10, 4, right? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So Moroni 10, 4, it's actually, there's a, there's a few verses. I think it's like, you could probably go up to 10, 3 through 5. Um, but yeah, that's, those are the scriptures that tell you um, to, to pray um, with a sincere heart if these things are not true. Um, mm -hmm. And um, if you should pray with a sincere heart, then, then the Holy Spirit will reveal these things to you. Yeah. Um, he, they, he, he will manifest the truth unto you. So what, what the, what the LDS, what the, the, their missionaries will tell you is that, uh, you need to read the book of Mormon and then read these verses, Moroni, uh, 10, 4, 10, 3 through five, whatnot, that, uh, you pray about these things. And that if you pray with a sincere heart, asking God for the truth, 
that he will manifest this truth unto you, which is how they take it. They will say it's something as like a, um, a burning in the bosom. So if you get this feeling in your chest, or if you just get this tingling or, or, or just this experience when you're praying these things, that that is actually the Holy Spirit telling you that this is true and that, and that Mormonism is true. And you know, there you go. But what's, what's, weird about it um is that the bible seems to completely say the opposite and that's actually not at all how you're supposed to come to know truth now uh the latter-day saints they believe in the bible they have four standard works for their scriptures right they have the bible as far as it is translated correctly that's what they say they have the book of mormon they have the doctrine and covenants and the pearl of great price so they have four different works three of which being the latter works um, and then the Bible being uh, as far as it is translated correctly. So they believe that the Bible has been corrupted, which we'll get into as well. But, um, but with that, so again, we come to a very different understanding of how do we come to know truth? Because it seems like in the Bible, we have instances like Acts 17 and other places where, you know, with the Bereans, where Paul actually commends them for looking into the scriptures and seeing if the message of Jesus lines up with what God has already said, right? So God has already said something, new revelation seems to come, and then we need to see, we need to confirm that, right? And so, and so that seems very different than just praying about it and then getting a feeling because that, that, that seems like it could be open to a lot of, uh, um, misinterpretation or just, you know, how do I know that the thermostat's not two degrees lower and that I'm getting goosebumps because of that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, so what we've been talking about, this this way of like knowing truth, um, the technical term for that is epistemology. Um, so it's the study of truth. It's the study of how we can know truth. Um, and so we differ significantly on our epistemology between Christians and Mormons. Um, and as Cole was just saying, um, there's even a tendency within professing Christians or, or Christians today and in, in our communities that actually have more of a Mormon epistemology when it comes to truth, because um, they might say, well, I believe it because, um, you know, because I prayed about it and, and God told me this or that. Um, and that's what Mormons believe. Um, but we believe, you know, it's we wouldn't say that prayer is a bad way to to come to truth um because it's i mean we we would believe the bible you know we would say that god does um reveal things to us supernaturally um but the problem with that is you can't have that as your primary test for truth uh, because all throughout scripture god warns us um of deceiving spirits um and he also warns us of our own hearts um our 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 corrupt hearts that will deceive ourselves um, you know, in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says the heart is deceitful above all things who can know it. Um, and so we have to be very wary of relying on our feelings to test truth um, because our hearts are so prone to deceive ourselves. Um, for instance, um, another when we're talking to Mormons, a thing that we like to bring up is, okay, we'll ask them, you know, you say that you believe this because you prayed about it and you had a spiritual experience. Um, well, what, what happens if we, um, you know, we invite um, a Muslim into this conversation and they say that they prayed to Allah and they received a spiritual experience uh, praying about if the, um, the Quran was true, right? Um, so that's right there. That's the exact same epistemology of a Mormon. But obviously, they're going to be receiving a very different answer than a Mormon is because they're believing in a different God uh, with a different set of scriptures. So if they use the same test for truth, but they come up with two completely different answers, you know, then obviously that that can't be, you know, that can't be a good test for truth, not for ultimate truth. Um, we have to have a standard for testing truth that can be applied across the board, right? For testing if something is in line with reality. Yeah, I think a, I think a great question is, and, and, and once that happens, so let's say we do have our Muslim friend and then we're button heads right there, the Latter-day Saints are, because I, I believe this because I prayed about it, I believe this because I prayed about it. Is there anything else that we can use to see who's right? 
or, or maybe both are wrong. And that's what we would say is because I think, and Stan would agree that we, we have overwhelming evidence that Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, um, is a hundred percent verifiable, uh, with, with more than just praying about it, right? We have archaeological evidence. We have evidence of Jesus rising from the dead. We have evidence of the Bible not being corrupted, which again, we'll get into later today. So, um, so I really think it's a disservice to the LDS people that they've just been told to just turn their brains off and just pray. And then if they get a feeling to just walk along, like nothing's happened about it. And whenever they get um, something thrown at them and same thing with the evangelicals, the evangelicals do this just as much, but when they get something thrown at them that they can't answer, they just fall back on, Oh, I prayed about it and just keep moving on. I, I, I think that's like a, I think that's a criminal act of doing that. Of, of, that's like malpractice thinking, right? Cause, cause no, the whole, the whole thing is, is that God's given us minds, right. Uh, uh, to, uh, to be sanctified by the renewal of our minds. Yeah. Romans 12 too. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We're, that, we're supposed to be growing in this knowledge and truth, not just turning away from it and anything that seems to oppose it. Right. So, um, so that's something that, so with that truth, um, we think that, uh, first off, just the, the way we come to it is very, very different. Um, but even more significant than that, I think is what we're about to get into now with, um, just the nature of God and Jesus. Right. So this, this, I would say, these are make or break salvation things, right? Um, if, if, if you, if you are, uh, worshiping or praying to a different Jesus, to a different God, um, these are very, very uh, big things. Now, a Latter Day Saint will tell you, "We have Jesus Christ in the name of our church. <laughs> How can? What do you mean we don't worship Jesus? Right? Well, he, he's right there. He's the center of everything." But we'll look into right now just how different these things actually are and how big that actually is. So, Stan, if you want to take it for who is God, and we can talk about this just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think um, when we're having these conversations, it's really, really important to define our terms. Um, and I say that because we will use the same terminology as a Mormon in like many, many cases, but what we mean by those terms, um, are completely different. <laughs> so, um, some people like to say, you know, we have the same, um, kind of lexicon, um, but the, the meaning of those words are just, they've been completely redefined. A very different dictionary. Yeah. Different dictionary. Uh, same lexicon. Um, so, so yeah, so starting off with a Christian definition of, of who God is. Um, so this is just kind of a basic Orthodox Christian definition. We would say that um, there is one God um, who is a spirit, who is personal, eternal, infinite, all-knowing creator of all that exists. He is the only God and necessary for all things to exist. He exists eternally as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He created the heavens and the earth ex nihilo, which is Latin for out of nothing. All right, so that's really important as well, that he's, he's self-existing and he created everything through, the, through his breath um, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before him, nothing was, and nothing was um, that didn't come from him. Exactly, yeah. And so now, what, is, what does a Mormon believe about God? Okay, so they believe, um, well, if you say God, um, they're generally talking about Heavenly Father. Um, so they believe that Heavenly Father is an exalted man with a physical body of flesh and bone. He is not eternal um, in the sense that he always existed. Um, Mormons might say that he's eternal because there's scriptures in the Book of Mormon that says God is eternal. But they, again, they don't mean the same thing by eternal as we do. As yeah. we do. So he's not eternal. Um, he is the only God of this world. Um, he, uh, now this is where it kind of gets weird, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to say it because this is their doctrine. Um, he had sex with at least one of his goddess wives. Um, so sometimes there's not clarity on this, um, but he, he did, you know, sexually reproduce, um, with he's, he, I mean, he probably has many, many wives, but at least one wife, um, which we, they would say, um, is heavenly mother, um, to produce spirit children in this, the preexistence. Um, so this, the preexistence is this kind of spiritual realm before, um, before 
the earth was created um, before before humans became mortal. Um, and so, so yeah, God is having, um, creating all these spirit babies with his goddess wives. Um, and so, and God is, he is the one of three gods in the God, Godhood, um, which includes Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Yeah, which are three separate beings um, and persons completely. Right, you could count one, two, three, and they would they would say they're they're three beings, but they're one in purpose, not not um, in being. So they they would say that they're all working towards the same goal, and that's what they mean by Trinity. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there's actually a quote from Joseph Smith that said that um, the three personages um, that make up the Godhood are actually three separate gods. Um, now today, many Mormons will say, "Well, actually, there's only one God, because um, they worship one God." Um, but even within the gods of this world, they believe in three separate beings. Um, and so, ontologically, um, we say if you have a separate being, then that's a separate God, right? Um, and so, and and again, so God, He didn't create out of nothing, right? Um, and that's really important as well. Because, you know, we believe that God was self-existing and he created everything that exists out of nothing. Um, but Mormons don't believe that God is a self-existing God, that there was actually a God before him and a God before him and, and so on. Um, and so they believe the only thing that's really internal um, is matter itself. So he reorganized pre-existing matter. Um, and, um, and, you know, that's a really significant difference. Um, that he, yeah, he didn't create out of nothing. And also Mormons believe that there's um, an innumerable amount of gods, um, you know, gods that you can't even count. Yeah, it seems it seems weird because, so what they'll say is that there's these, intel that it was all just intelligence, right? That it was just this matter. You can't even, it's, it's weird to say in space because it would be before our space, but just these intelligences and these matters that were just there with these eternal laws reigning over them. And then all of a sudden, boom, this uh, long, long line of infinite God started, but it's an infinite line of God. So how could that even start? It, it, anyways, it's, it's just, it's really confusing stuff. Um, just thinking about it, I think, but the main, but the main thing is, is that God, this God was even, created quote unquote rearranged by another god and that he would that yes he was a man just like us like we there's countless quotes of joseph smith talking about this um the probably the most famous is from the king follow discourse um that he preached in 1844 he says we have imagined and supposed that god was god from all eternity i will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see um and then he later goes on to say that we must become gods ourselves yeah, exactly. That's from the King Follett Discourse, um, which is a very famous sermon from Joseph Smith. He delivered at a funeral um, towards the, I think it was towards the end of his ministry. Um, and um, yeah, in this, in this sermon, he, he um, explained, you know, his doctrine of God um, being a God that was not God from all eternity and telling people that they actually had to learn to become gods themselves um and at that point um that that was a radical departure from orthodox christianity um because even in the book of mormon um there's lots of scriptures that sound similar to an orthodox understanding of god um we would actually say that those the scriptures that talk about god in the book of mormon um are actually kind of modalistic um which is a heresy of the early church, um, which believed that God was um, one God, but he took on different forms. Um, and so they would, a, a modalist would believe that God the Father is the same as, as Jesus and is the same as the Holy Spirit, but they, they appear, or God appears in those three different forms and he changes in, in between. Um, and that's similar to kind of the way that God is described in the Book of Mormon. Um, now, you know, by the end of Joseph Smith's ministry from the King Follett Discourse, we have a completely under, different understanding um, of who God is because, you know, as soon as you say that 
God was not God from all eternity, um, and that you can become gods yourselves, then you have you don't have one God anymore. You have an infinite number of gods, um, which is very, very different from you know anything that um, Orthodox Christianity has ever taught. Yeah. Now, obviously, we would say this is completely different than uh, what, what we say because we read in John four twenty four, God is spirit, right? But then even maybe even more important, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth, right? So we can't worship God all willy-nilly, however we want. That seems fit. That's Jesus talking right there saying, hey, you got to worship him and you got to worship him correctly, right? And so, um, but this God, we would say, is a completely different God. He's not even in the same realm, right? This one has flesh and bone. This one has... This one was once a man. Um, some would even say that he was a sinner and that he actually had to work off his sin, right? We'll get into that more with the with salvation. Yeah, that's a really interesting question to ask. Um, so when, when we get into a lot of kind of these Mormons might call them higher doctrines about eternal progression and the nature of God um, as 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 once a man, um, if you interact with Mormons, and this is actually a really important key principle to keep in mind, um, we're talking about what Latter-day Saints have historically believed, um, but that doesn't mean that if you encounter a Mormon, they're going to believe everything that we're talking about, right? Um, in fact, there's a lot of changes that ha have happened over the course of, you know, basically 200 years of Mormon history. Um, and so we're talking about the very origins of Mormonism with Joseph Smith. Um, but today, um, there's even a lot of dispute about, you know, what, you know, some Mormons might not believe that God was once a man, even though that's part of their historic teaching. Yeah, well, we actually, Stan, you and I, when when Stan came on the mission trip, we had a mission trip up in, uh, back, uh, back in March, and Stan and I were talking to two sister missionaries, and towards the end of our conversation, uh, Stan brought up the Lorenzo Snow couplet, which is basically just a couplet that um, historically the LDS have pretty much like learn to memorize to think about eternal progression where um as uh, as man is god once was as god is man may become um so that historically has been everywhere um lorenzo snow was an old prophet and uh but anyways stan brought that up to our sister missionaries that we were talking to and they looked dumbfounded that they had never even heard that before which is crazy just because we know through studying that this has been a this has been a hallmark of their faith forever yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And I've also talked to another Mormon who thought that that was a Brigham Young quote. Um, and Really? Yeah, and he also, wow. he thought, you know, that's kind of like a speculation, but it's not official hmm. teaching. Um, so sometimes there's a tendency to say, like, a prophet may have said that, but it's not in our scriptures. It's not in our standard works, so we don't have to believe that, um, which is sometimes a common objection from from our Latter-day Saint friends. Um, now, we would say, you know, if that's a part of your teaching at all, then that needs to be challenged, right? Um, even if you, you know, say it's not official doctrine. Well, your founder, your founder is teaching it. Exactly. So he's, I mean, he's the mouthpiece of God. Every, every, every prophet's the mouthpiece of God. But anyways, all right. So uh, hopefully through that, we could just show you just a few differences between just who God is. But um we're going to move in now to who Jesus is, which I think is just as crazy with this. So what, so here, this would be our Christian, our biblical definition of Jesus. We would say Jesus Christ was the virgin born God incarnate, right? So he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was God incarnate, fully man, fully God. He who's existed in all time with the father and Holy spirit and in the, in the eternal Trinity, right? So these three have been existing and communing with each other since eternity passed, right? We can't even, we can't even count before time. Yeah. There's never a beginning. Exactly. Forever. Eternal. Truly eternal. As a man, he possessed two natures, human and divine. Not 50-50, fully, 100% both, right? At the same time, he was fully man, he was fully God. He lived a sinless life, a life that we couldn't, and he willingly died on the cross as an atonement for our sins, for all that repent and believe in him. So if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, his blood on that cross when God poured his wrath out covers our sins entirely. And we we actually get Jesus' righteousness from that. 
he doesn't just cover our sin, but he actually gives us his righteousness. Um, and we believe that's what the Bible teaches, right? Uh, John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And later in the chapter, we go on to read that the word is actually Jesus. This word was God. Yeah. The word became flesh. Yeah. And was with God. He became flesh. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So this this says that he created everything, but actually Jesus is also sustaining everything. He is holding, right now, he's holding it all together, right? The reason that we can still talk and do all these things is because God is still keeping us in existence. And that's from Colossians 1, uh, 15 through 17. Yeah. And I mean, those are so, those are so, you know, really good verses on mm -hmm. what we um, believe about Jesus. Uh, we would say it's our, our Christology, which is the study of who Jesus is. Um, and also just, just an interesting thing to note um, in those verses in Colossians, Colossians 1, 15, it talks about Jesus being the firstborn of all creation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what we'll, we'll see is that Mormons actually take that, um, as a very literal, um, he's literally the first offspring of all creation, uh, the first literal begotten son. Um, and you know, it's really important to, to, when we're looking at this actually to know what the Greek means, um, the Greek, uh, word f and, and for firstborn, um, it actually means he is the preeminent of all creation. Um, not that he is like the literal firstborn of all creation, but he is the preeminent one of over all creation. Um, and so when we talk about the Mormon definition of who Jesus is, um, they believe that Jesus was a spiritual firstborn son of God um, in the preexistence. So he literally is our elder brother. Um, he is the only begotten physical offspring of God um, by procreation on earth. Um, and so what that also means is, so, so Jesus was the firstborn in the preexistence, right? But when Jesus became incarnate, um, Mormons believe that, that God, um, Heavenly Father, he, he came down to earth um, and had physical relations with Mary to, um, to physically begot, um, well, to physically, um, you know, have those relations with Mary to, so that Jesus would be physically begotten. Um, and that's, um, that's also a key difference because, um, that means that Jesus wasn't actually, um, born of a virgin birth, right? Yeah, exactly. But, they, but, they, but they will say, they will say that he was, but this is where it gets back to our definitions and what we mean, because what we learn is that when they say Virgin Mary, they mean, yeah, Mary was a virgin <laughs> up until heavenly father came and had intercourse with her. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, going back to what I said earlier about, you know, Mormons, n most Mormons not, might not even understand this distinction. They might not even know this, but this is what their prophets have taught. Um, Bruce R. McConkie, he wrote a book called Mormon Doctrine. And in that book, it, it says that Jesus was um, physically, you know, he was the physical offspring of God by procreation on earth. Um, and so, and that's not the only place that it's cited, it's cited all throughout early Mormon history um, by Brigham Young and others. Um, but like, you know, this is, has always been a consistent teaching of their church. And, and today there's kind of um, a tendency to kind of, to not talk about that um, within the Mormon church. There's a lot of um, a kind of evolution in doctrine in a ways to, to move away from things that sound weird. Um, mm -hmm. because you would have to deny the virgin birth if you really consistently held this position. But of course, there's a lot of uh, redefinition of terms. Yeah, exactly. So with, so with this, uh, getting back to Jesus being the, f the spiritual firstborn. So like we said, before this world, the LDS believed that there was this, um, preexistent spirit world, right? The preeminence, um, and that we were all spirits or we were just matter. And then uh, Heavenly Father had sex with Heavenly Mother and then basically rearranged our spiritness and made us us as spirits, right? So in that, 
So this, so this is what they mean when Jesus was the firstborn, that he was the first one that Heavenly Father did that to, right? Um, and and then along the line comes us. So like Stan said, we are literally Jesus' spiritual brother in a sense, um, that there is no difference between him and I except the time in which we were born. And that also includes everybody. So in that, that includes Lucifer. And so they actually believe that Lucifer, Satan, the enemy, is brothers with Jesus. Yeah, Lucifer was the second born of all creation, and Jesus was the first born. Um, and then every other human being that's ever existed falls somewhere in that line of um, spiritual offspring from from God the Father. Um, and so you and I, um, we, in, in Mormon doctrine, we are... Um, you know, we're also begotten, um, by the father, like, uh, literally, um, in a spiritual, like preexistence. Um, and so Jesus is our, he's our elder brother. Um, you know, what we would say the, you know, a, a key problem with that, um, obviously there's lots of problems, but, um, you know, what is that, what's the distinction between Jesus and me? If Jesus is just my elder brother, right? We believe that Jesus, from a Christian Orthodox perspective, like he is completely separate from who I am. Um, I am a human being, a mortal, I'm like I, I'm a creature from the dirt, right? That God created me, he spoke uh, life into me, he spoke um, his from his breath. Yeah, he breathed his breath into us. Yeah. I had a beginning, um, but, you know, and... But Jesus, um, and an Orthodox view is, is, um, eternal. He, he never had a beginning. He was God from the very beginning. Um, and so it's just a, a very different ontological understanding of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when this comes, so because Jesus is the firstborn from heavenly father, he also had to gain his exaltation, um, which, uh, we'll probably get into, uh, we'll, we'll get into later. Um, when we talk about salvation again, a lot of this comes with, uh, their idea of salvation, what that looks like. But, um, so basically Jesus, Jesus, uh, was on the same track and is on the same track as us. He's just further down. The, he's just further down the line. Right. Um, so, but this actually gets re so we, we've touched on this already, but this gets into our next difference, which we don't have to spend a lot of time on cause we already have, but who is man, right? So who is mankind? So as a Christian, we would say, like Stan was just saying that humans first off were created in God's image, right? That big word created, we were created in God's image. We weren't rearranged into God's image. We weren't reorganized from spirit into God's image. We were created in his image, right? Every person is a unique, precious being of dignity and worth because of the fall, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, we are separated from God and we are born as children of wrath. So when the fall happened, um, we, we have this curse of sin on us and we are all born with this thing that we call original sin, that um, we are just born inherently sinful, right? And that we are all deserving of God's judgment. But through the atonement of Jesus, we may be reconciled and adopted as God's children. We will always be creatures never gods not once in the bible does it ever talk about us becoming gods right now we have some verses where lds would like to say that us gaining our glory is um in a way of is a way of exaltation like that 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 is saying that we will be exalted and become gods by getting glory um but we would say that clearly in the context of those scriptures especially when paul is talking that we are actually ta that he's actually talking about the glory that we will earn through being in jesus that being in Jesus and then being with him in heaven as a Christian, as a believer, that the glory that we gain is his glory that he's given to us that we didn't earn and that we're not becoming our own gods, but instead that we get to share in the, in the love and the life of Jesus for eternity. Right? So, um, that's just, a, so that's what we believe as Christians. And when we say Orthodox, we don't mean like Greek Orthodox or anything. We just mean traditional Christianity, what the church has always held, right? What the belief has always been. Um, we're not ascribing to any uh, denomination when we say that, but like we said, the Mormon definition is that humans are pre-existed spiritual offsprings of heavenly father and mother, right? So they believe in a heavenly mother or mothers. They are born basically good and are gods and embryo. They do not, they do not affirm original sin. 
uh, as and, and like we said, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. That's Lorenzo Snow, one of their prophets. All humans are children of God. There is no original sin, and we will only be punished for our own sins. Article of Faith 2, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. That's what they say. So, you got any thoughts on that, Stan? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, so I think... Right off the bat, you know, when we're looking at this Mormon definition of humanity, um, we have to understand this from a biblical worldview. This is actually denying um, core doctrines of the faith. Um, it's denying um, that we, you know, so in original sin, um, that's a that's a really important doctrine because what we see that in Scripture um, in the Psalms, um, David says that he was born into sin and his in his mother's womb um he was um conceived in iniquity um mm -hmm. and before and that's before he ever even committed any sin right in his mother's womb but he was still born into sin that was his that was his nature and that was that was given to him from his forefather adam right so his very nature was as a child of wrath and it wasn't until god had mercy on him and gave him the gift of faith, then his nature changed. David's nature changed from uh, from a child of wrath to a child of God. So his heart of stone was turned into a heart of flesh, right? Exactly. And that's for all of humanity. We, we can become reconciled to God purely through the blood of Christ and believing in him and the true Jesus, mm -hmm. right? So we do not start off as children of God. Um, absolutely not. Um, yeah, no. but it's an, it's also important to understand that because all human beings are created in the image of God, we do p possess dignity and worth, um, purely because we are created in the image of God. Um, and with that comes, mm -hmm. it, be, it gives us, um, dignity and worth because of who God is. Yeah. Not because of us. Like if we could, if, if we could lose that dignity and worth given to us through our image, we, we would have lost it. Right. Any, any worth that we were given, any, if we could have lost anything, we, we would lose it. Anything that God's given us, like we, it would be gone. Yeah. So, but, and, and, but, and like what Stan was saying, we are not born, um, children of God. Uh, we, again, we read in John one towards the end that it says that whoever believes in him, him being Jesus, that they earn the right to become children of God, right? That through that faith and belief, that's what makes us children of God, right? We get adopted into his family, but before that is not the case and that we are children of wrath, right? And so that gets back into um, the fact that, so they don't believe in original sin. They believe it's our own sins. So they, so, so an LDS would believe that, yeah, if you, if, if you went your whole life and you were perfect, if, if, if you could be, we would say you can't, right? That That's actually, that, that's impossible. There's no way anyone could be perfect. That's why we need a savior. But even if you could, that 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 you would that you would be able to go to heaven that you would be exalted because of that because you were perfect um and that original sin you are not tainted by that but romans tells us and romans is such a good book um but romans tells us in romans 5 verse 12 just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in in this way death came to all people because all sinned so it literally says right there that just as sin entered the world through one man and death comes through sin. We all know that. In this way, death came to all people. Just the, it, 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 it flat out is right there. Now, I, now I don't want to be rude or crude when I say this, but it just seems like Joseph Smith just didn't read the Bible. <laughs> he, I don't. He just didn't understand. He, he maybe was listening to some of the awakening preachers and what they believed, but I don't think he ever sat down and read the Bible himself because he would see clearly that a lot of his doctrine that he created was is just refuted. Yeah, well, it's very interesting because there's actually um, a translation of the Bible that Joseph Smith wrote, right, called the Joseph Smith Translation. Mm -hmm. Now, L the LDS Church doesn't use this um, as a standard work or like an authoritative scripture, um, scriptural book. Um, the history behind that is interesting, though, because apparently um, after Joseph Smith died, um, the copyright for the Joseph Smith translation stayed with um, like Emma Smith, which was 
his first wife and and I guess some of the people that that stayed in in Missouri uh, for the reorganized Church of Latter Day Saints. There's a lot of offshoots of Mormonism. It's I mean we can go into this in further episodes, um, but anyway, long story short. Brigham Young, who brought the church out west to Utah, he didn't have the copyright for the Joseph Smith translation, so they just didn't use it. Um, but in the Joseph Smith translation, um, there's a verse in Romans 4, 5. It says, well, so in, in our Bibles, what we believe is that God justifies the ungodly, right? So we are all ungodly because we are in sin. From the moment of birth, from the moment of conception, we are in sin. We are under a curse, the curse um, that was given to us through the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, we are under a curse of sin and death, and we can't reconcile ourselves to God. Only God can reconcile us to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ, which breaks the curse through faith alone. But Mormons believe that we aren't born as as enemies of God. We aren't born as uh, ungodly people um, that actually Joseph Smith, he didn't understand Romans and he, he retranslated that verse, Romans 4, 5, to say that God does not justify the ungodly. Well, my question is, my question is, if he doesn't, if he doesn't justify the ungodly, then who does he justify? <laughs> because we're all ungodly. Because <laughs> <laughs> the three verses before say that that's everybody. Except Jesus. Yeah, no, I have the verse right here. So, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So what does Joseph Smith do? He literally puts the word not in the verse. Changes the complete meaning. So, yeah. So, but it is, but it is odd that a co it seems like a copyright stops uh, the, 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 true, the one true church from having a, uh, a correct translation of the Bible that they believe is corrupt. But anyways, uh, with, but, but with that, I actually think, uh, so Stan and I, we're actually kind of going a little longer on time than we wanted to. So I think, especially with these next two um, topics, uh, the reliability of scripture and uh, the salvation that the um, LDS believe in, um, that would take a whole completely uh, long time. That would just take a long time to get done with. So I think that right now would actually be a good stopping point Stan if you agree just to we got the first four points out and then we could just right now do the next episode definitely I think that the next few points are enough for another episode for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah you yeah, know totally so um but uh we I just we just want to thank everybody that uh listened to this um uh sorry if there was any background noise or if Stan and I are very boring this is our first attempt at a podcast but we are we are chugging along. We, we think these are things that people need to hear about. And so hopefully you got something out of this, whether you are a Latter-day Saint or a Christian. Um, and especially next episode, I think uh, we can show you that we have what we have what the authors wrote in the Bible and that actually the salvation that um, the Latter-day Saints are working towards are, is, a, is not a salvation at all. And actually it's the worst thing that you could be doing. So um, Stan, do you have any closing remarks as we end? Yeah, I just want to say again um, to all of our listeners, um, especially our Latter-day Saint listeners, um, if you've come this far already, um, please, please know that we are only doing this because we love you. Um, in fact, if we if we didn't love you, then we would the we wouldn't be doing this at all, right? Because can can you imagine like if someone believed that their friend was destined to to go to hell because they didn't believe in the true Jesus, then the most unloving thing that you could do is not tell them that, right? So because we believe that Latter-day Saints don't have the true gospel and that there are eternal consequences for that that will separate them from God forever, um, the most loving thing that we can do is to tell them about who Jesus really is and to challenge them on their beliefs. Yeah. So uh, we just want to thank you guys again so much. I think Stan put it perfectly. We love you guys. We love you LDS listeners. We love you not LDS listeners. Um, we just we just think these things matter. And so thank you so much for listening to our first episode. We're going to crank out this next one real fast to finish those six points that we differ with the Latter-day Saint population. Uh, thanks so much for listening and you guys have a great rest of your day.